Today's episode is sponsored by NetSuite, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform. Over 27,000 businesses already use NetSuite. And for the new year, NetSuite has a new financing program for those ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash gold. Another strong day in the gold market today. Gold rose over $14 an ounce. We closed at $18.68.50 or thereabouts. I think this is the highest we've been in about eight months on the price of gold. Silver price is also up today, about 19 cents, closing at 23.54. The mining stocks also had a strong day. I think they're up about 3%, led higher by a 7.5% rise in Barrick Gold, one of the largest gold producers in the world. It reported better than expected earnings today, not only better earnings, but better guidance. The stock is now up 17% on the year. I think it's also at about an eight month high, but I think the entire sector remains undervalued. I think a lot more positive surprises await this industry. Higher gold and silver prices, higher copper prices, Earnings are going to go up. The outlooks are going to be raised. I think this sector remains very cheap. And what's driving it is inflation. In fact, yesterday we had a buying opportunity in gold and better in the gold mining stocks because the market sold off because we got some news of some de-escalation of the geopolitical risks. You had Russia apparently calling back some of its troops from the Ukrainian border and that easing of tensions sent gold down about 20 bucks and gold and silver mining stocks got hammered. But of course, the real reason that investors are buying gold is not because of what's going on in the Ukraine. I mean, sure, when the news broke, there was some short-term buying. Speculators were always trying to capitalize on the news. So there was some buying on the margin on Friday or maybe Monday based on the escalation of these hostilities. And so as we had a de-escalation, the price backed off a bit. But the underlying trend has nothing to do with that threat. The real threat is inflation. That's why investors are buying gold. And that's why they bought the dip on Tuesday. And we rose to new highs on Wednesday because we got a lot more inflation data Some that came out yesterday, some more that came out today. And then, of course, we got the federal open market minutes, which were released later today. I'm going to talk about all of that and why that's driving the price of gold higher. I'm going to start with the economic data and I'll work my way up to the FOMC minutes. So yesterday, we got the release of producer prices for the month of January. Now we already have the consumer price numbers that were hotter than expected. And the PPI was more of the same. The expectation was for a rise of one half of 1%. In fact, the range went from a low of 0.1 to a high of 0.7. So the highest anybody expected producer prices to rise in January was 7 tenths of 1%. Instead, prices were up a full percentage point. That's just one month, right? If you annualize that, that's better than 12% a year. We're up 1% in a month, double what had been estimated. And adding insult to injury, they also doubled what was reported in December. We only got a 0.2% increase in December. So maybe that raised some hopes that inflation was transitory after all. Well, the hopes were dashed because they increased that to 0.4%, not nearly as bad as the 1% for January, but still twice as bad as was originally reported. Year over year, headline producer prices are now up 9. 7%. Now that's the same that they were up in the prior period. So I'm not really sure how that happened, but the consensus was for a decline to 9.2%. We didn't decline. We stayed at 9.7%. If you X out food and energy, it's almost as bad. They were expecting a gain of 0.5, which was actually the high end of a narrow consensus. The estimates range from up 0.4 to up 0.5 up 0.8, not quite double the high end, but still a lot more than had been expected. And if you X out 
food and energy. The core PPI up 8.3% that matched the gain from December and it was above the 8% that investors had been expecting based on the consensus. So a bad report. In fact, if you take out food, energy, and transportation, prices were up 0.9% versus an expectation of a rise of 0.4%. So overall, another bad report card on inflation. The numbers are worse than expected, meaning higher than expected. And again, the initial reaction when these numbers were released was that gold went down. I mean, traders still have that Pavlovian dog type reflex to respond to any kind of higher than expected inflation data by selling gold. Again, why are they selling when they should be buying? Because they look at these high inflation numbers as a sign that the Fed is now going to do something about inflation. Oh, the Fed wasn't worried and now they're going to do something. So we better sell gold because the Fed's going to jack up rates. The Fed is not going to do anything. I mean, they may do something, but it's not going to be enough to fight inflation. It's not going to be enough to hurt gold. First, the Fed pretended there was no inflation. Then they pretended that inflation was transitory. Now they're pretending they're going to fight it. They're not going to fight it. If they could have fought inflation, they would have started the fight a long time ago. They would never have allowed the inflation genie to get this far out of the bottle if they had a way of keeping it inside. The reason they didn't fight inflation was because they can't, because fighting inflation would collapse the bubble economy. Well, if they couldn't fight inflation when it was smaller, they sure as hell can't fight it now when it's much bigger. Any damage that they didn't want to do to the economy when we had less inflation, they would do even more damage now that we have more inflation because they have to be even more aggressive in their tightening than they would have had to been had they started sooner, which they didn't. So the whole thing is a bluff. The markets are going to have to wake up to this one day. But before they do, while they're still asleep, I am imploring that anybody who is listening to this podcast load up on the stocks that will benefit from inflation and not just the gold and silver mining stocks, but there are a lot of stocks outside the United States, value dividend paying stocks that will provide, I think, excellent protection from the inflation that lies ahead, which is going to be far worse than anyone believes. And also yesterday, by the way, we got weaker than expected economic data coming out of New York. The Empire State Manufacturing Index was supposed to rise by 10, and instead it rose by 3.1, which was actually below the low end of the consensus range, which went from 3.5 to 21. We came out at 3.1. Yes, it was better than the minus 0.7 we got for January, but still, it is a weak economy, strong inflation, stagflation, investors should be buying gold with both hands and they will when they actually understand the box that the Fed has placed us in. Now today we got more news on inflation. We got the retail sales numbers for January and these numbers were hotter than expected and there was an expectation of a big rebound because we got a big decline in December and in fact that decline was now increased So that might pull something out of the fourth quarter GDP numbers that are going to be revised. But the January number, the expectation was for a 2% gain in retail sales. We got a 1.9% drop in retail sales in January. Well, that drop was revised to an even bigger drop of minus 2.5%. So we rebounded from a lower level, but we rebounded in an even stronger way. We were up 3.8%. Now that gain was in the middle of the range of expectations, which went from 0.9 to up 5.5. So it wasn't like we blew expectations away, but it still was a stronger number. But you have to remember, these numbers are not adjusted for inflation. So just because retail sales are up, it doesn't mean that Americans are buying more stuff. It could mean they're buying less stuff. They're just paying higher prices for the stuff that they're buying. And in fact, that is what's going on. If you X out vehicles, the increase was not as big. And we know that because automobile prices are dramatically higher, right? 40% year over year on used cars. I forget what the increase is for new cars. But in the prior month, it was initially reported down 2.3, revised to down 2.8. The consensus was for a gain of one and we gained 3.3%. Now this was above the upper end because that was 1.9. So here we blew away the estimates. When you take out vehicles and gasoline, same thing. Last month, down 2.5. Expectation was 
for up 0.6. Well, we revised last month's to down 3.2, but we shot up 3.8 in January. That's about double the upper end of consensus, which was 1.6. The lower was 0.4. These are hotter numbers, but again, it's inflation that is heating them up because it's higher prices that is driving retail sales. And another way that we know that is by looking at the import-export prices that were released today, also for the month of January. The consensus was for an increase in import prices of 1.3%. Instead, they rose by 2% in one month. 2% increase in prices in a single month, right? If you annualize that, that's what, 25% or something like that. Big, big numbers on import prices. The range was for up 0.5 to up 1.5, so a pretty big range, but we still managed to top the high end of that range. That's a big number. Americans buy a lot of imports and those imports are getting a lot more expensive. And by the way, those prices don't include the cost of importing them. The shipping costs are not in there. And we know that shipping costs are surging as well as the goods prices that are being shipped. Year over year, import prices are now up 10.8%. The expectation was for 10.2, which would have been a little bit of an improvement on the 104 from December. Instead, that number got worse because we went up to 10.8. But the prices are even higher with exports. They were looking for export prices to rise 0.7%. Instead, they rose 2.9%, more than quadruple what had been estimated. Year over year, export prices are now up 15.1%. The consensus was 14.6. The December number was 14.7. Think about that. Export prices up 15.1%. That's slightly more than double. The 7.5% increase for the CPI. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, why should we care if export prices go up? We want export prices to go up because Americans aren't paying the export prices. It's our trading partners. They're paying those higher prices. We're earning those higher prices. So higher prices for our exports is a good thing because it helps reduce our trade deficit, which in part is true. But I want to focus on the other aspect of rising export prices because we don't want to necessarily raise our prices because we may lose out to competition. Some of our customers may balk at these higher prices and decide to buy from somebody else. But my point about this is that most of the stuff, probably all of the stuff that we make to export, we also make to sell domestically. It's not like we're coming up with products that nobody in America buys. These export companies are making stuff, selling some stuff in America and some stuff outside America. Well, if the price of the stuff they're selling outside of America is up by 15.1%, stands to reason that the stuff that they're selling inside America is up by the same amount because it's got the same cost structure. The only extra cost is the shipping and the shipping costs aren't in here. So the point is, American companies that are subject to domestic inflation are having to raise their prices by 15.1%. This number, I think, is far more reflective of what's actually happening to consumer prices in the United States than the 7.5% number that we get in the CPI, because this number is not manipulated. There's no hedonics. There's no substitution. There's no owner's equivalent rent to drag it down. These are actual prices. And actual prices are up 15.1%, which again, jives with what the CPI would be reporting if we were still measuring prices the same way we did in 1982, which was the last time we had a 7.5% year-over-year gain in consumer prices. If we still had that CPI to measure today's price increases, that would also be 15%. So that is the real number. We have 15% inflation, and it's going to get worse because the Fed is not actually fighting it. They're only pretending to fight it because they can't. And in fact, one of the most frustrating things about the inflation story is how badly the media is covering it. They're coming up with excuses and explanations, always ignoring the elephant in the room, which is the real cause of inflation, which is the government. It is the large deficit spending that is being monetized by the Federal Reserve. You know, one of the things that they're talking about a lot today is wage price spiral. 
They're digging up that term from the 1970s. I'm hearing it a lot because wages are up and people are worrying about this wage price spiral as if that's what's going to cause inflation. Like this thing is going to get out of control because wages are going to go up and that's going to force prices up. And now prices are up. So workers demand higher wages. And so they get increases in their wages. But now their employers have to raise prices again because they just had to raise wages. And it's this spiral that goes out of control as if the Federal Reserve and the government are just innocent bystanders and they're the victim of this runaway spiral. The whole thing is nonsense because wages going up don't cause prices to go up because wages are prices. Wages are the price of labor. One person's cost is another person's price. So wages are prices. So when someone says we have a wage price spiral, what they're really saying is we have a price price spiral. Prices are going up because prices are going up. That's nonsense. Prices are going up because of inflation. Prices are going up because the Federal Reserve is printing all this money to monetize government debt and artificially suppress interest rates. And because the Fed is doing this, prices are rising. And those prices include wages. Wages are some of the prices that are going up because of inflation. So it's not that wages are causing prices to go up. It's that inflation is causing both wages and other prices to go up at the same time. And so it's not a spiral where the Fed is just some innocent bystander just watching helplessly as this thing is playing out. The Fed has set the whole process in motion and it's not a process where prices feed on wages. It's wages have to go up because money is losing value. Workers need to earn more money to afford higher prices. Prices go up because businesses' prices are going up. Their costs are going up, which are also prices, and they pass that on to their consumers because they have to make a profit. And all of this is the result of Fed monetary policy and government fiscal policy. And while I'm on the topic of monetary and fiscal policy, I want to talk a little bit about what I said on my last podcast when I talked about Keynesian policy and stimulative monetary policy and stimulative fiscal policy and its effect on the economy, on its ability to increase aggregate demand. I just want to make it clear that that is the Keynesian theory. That is not economic reality. That's just what these people believe. And given the fact that they believe that, what they are doing right now confounds their own beliefs because they are pursuing the type of Keynesian policy that is reserved for a weak economy with low inflation. What they are doing right now is not what the Keynesian playbook lays out for a situation where you have a very strong economy and high inflation. They're doing the opposite. But I want to talk a little bit about the reality behind the Keynesian myth. Let me start off by talking about fiscal policy, and then I'll get to monetary policy. So fiscal policy can be expansionary or it could be contractionary. You would use an expansionary fiscal policy, again, according to Keynes, if the economy is weak, it's in recession, and it needs some stimulus, some support, the government steps in with an expansionary fiscal policy. On the other side, if the economy is too strong, right, it's overheating, and you have inflation, the way the Fed would fight against inflation is with a contractionary fiscal policy. An expansionary fiscal policy is when the government spends more than it collects in taxes. So in theory, according to Keynes, it is putting money into the economy, which is spent. And that additional spending increases aggregate demand, and that helps the economy. On the flip side, when inflation is too strong and the government wants to reduce aggregate demand, it has a contractionary fiscal policy and it shrinks the deficit. And the way it accomplishes this, if it wants to pursue an expansionary fiscal policy, it can cut taxes, it can increase government spending. But either way, it believes more money is being put into the economy. Either the government takes less money away from the taxpayer or it gives more money to the tax takers, people who are on welfare or something like that, or it actually mails out stimulus checks. On the other end, when you're talking about a contractionary policy, it does the opposite. It raises taxes to take money out of the economy, or it cuts government spending to put less money into the economy. Now, of course, we are running a $3 trillion budget deficit right now. So by any definition, we are running a highly expansionary fiscal policy right now. 
And of course, everybody is wondering, why do we have inflation? Well, all these Keynesians are not pointing to this massively accommodative fiscal policy. Nobody is calling for tax hikes on the middle class. Nobody is calling for spending cuts to try to reverse this policy to adopt a contractionary fiscal policy, which is exactly what the Keynesian doctors would order for what ails the economy. But I want to talk about why this is all a bunch of nonsense in the first place, that the government can increase aggregate demand by running deficits, because it can't. You don't increase demand on the aggregate by cutting somebody's taxes or increasing government spending. I mean, maybe you can increase aggregate desire. Maybe people have more money and so they want to spend it. But real demand comes from supply. Stuff has to be produced before it can be consumed. It doesn't matter how much money the government puts into the economy. If the economy doesn't put more goods and services into the economy, it doesn't make a difference. All that happens is prices go up. But the problem with Keynesians is they don't even understand where the money is coming from that the government is supposedly putting in. Because if you take the Fed out of the equation, so let's forget about monetary policy. When the government runs a larger deficit, it's not putting money into the economy because the money it spends needs to be taken out of the economy. See, the Keynesians always look at one half of the equation. They say, hey, if the government spends more money than it collects in taxes, we're going to have this increase in demand because consumers will have more money. True, consumers will have more money, but businesses will have less money because the government needs to borrow that money. So if the government starts running a deficit, where is the money coming from to fund that deficit? If it's not coming from the Federal Reserve, because we're going to assume there is no stimulative accommodative monetary policy. This is just fiscal policy operating on its own. So if the government runs larger deficits, those deficits have to be financed. The government has to go to the markets and borrow that money. Well, if the government borrows that money, it crowds out some other borrower because those funds are no longer available to be loaned out because money that is loaned to the government can't be loaned to somebody else. So if the government taps into our savings pool and borrows that money and the government is the highest credit quality borrower, right? Because it's not going to default. And so it's going to get a first crack at that money. So when the government dips into the savings pool, that pool is more shallow and now there's less water in it for everybody else. And so in aggregate, there is now less money available to finance other products. So the government hasn't put money into the economy. It's just rearranged the money that's already there. It's taking some money that would have been available to businesses to borrow or anybody else for that matter who needs to borrow money. We've reduced the saving supply available to fund private sector borrowing. And instead, we funded government sector borrowing. And all that money goes directly into consumption. But the money is taking out of savings and production. We have less production because businesses now have less funds available to borrow to invest in plant and equipment and things that might make the economy more productive. So if anything, the government shifts some demand forward, demand that might have happened in the future, it happened sooner, but overall, there's going to be a net diminishment in consumption because the government is diminishing the amount of production because it is diverting money that might otherwise have been borrowed and used to finance production and it has diverted that to consumption. The government doesn't have this secret stash of money that it can just sprinkle into the economy. It has to take from some people in order to give to somebody else. And the politicians always want to focus on what you can see, the money that is given to people to spend. They never talk about what you can't see, which is what happens when there's less savings available for businesses to borrow. There's less capital investment you ultimately have a much weaker economy. Now, one way around that, and of course, when the government does do this, the impact would generally be higher interest rates. Because if you're increasing demand for savings, because the government is now a big borrower, and now you have less savings available for everybody else, those other borrowers are going to bid up the cost of money. They're going to have to pay higher prices. So normally, if the government just pursues an expansionary fiscal policy on its own, 
it's going to result in higher interest rates, which is also going to have effect on all borrowers, not just businesses, but consumers. So consumers are going to pay higher interest rates on their mortgages, on their credit cards, on their auto loans. So that will take away some of the demand that the government believes it's providing by running these deficits in the first place. And that's one of the reasons that you normally have an accommodative monetary policy, an expansionary monetary policy to go along with an expansionary fiscal policy because the government doesn't want to crowd out those savings. So what happens is the Federal Reserve now steps up. And that's where I can get into monetary policy, which can either be accommodative or restrictive. An accommodative monetary policy or expansionary, that's where the Federal Reserve is printing more money buying government bonds, otherwise known as quantitative easing, and holding interest rates low. This is supposed to stimulate the economy by causing additional spending, and it's also helping to keep interest rates low because the Federal Reserve is loaning money to the government, buying up those bonds so that the government doesn't have to dip in to the private stock of savings to fund its borrowing because the Federal Reserve is doing it for them. Of course, there is no free lunch there because when the Federal Reserve prints money, money loses value. And now businesses that need to borrow money need to borrow more money because everything they need to buy is now more expensive. So you don't get something for nothing from the Fed. When the Fed does an expansionary monetary policy, it isn't like some secret sauce that it stirs in there that just creates economic growth. It just creates inflation. It makes prices go up. The myth that the Fed could stimulate the economy by printing money is just that. It's a myth. It creates inflation. Now, it can distort the economy. It can create asset bubbles. I mean, the Fed does a pretty good job of doing that when it creates inflation, but it doesn't create economic growth. Now, a contractionary monetary policy, which is what the Fed needs to do when it is fighting inflation, is the opposite. It needs to withdraw money from circulation. It needs to shrink its balance sheet. It needs to do quantitative tightening, and it needs to allow interest rates to rise. But as I said in prior podcasts, it has to allow interest rates to rise above the rate of inflation. What they're talking about now, what they're talking about doing amounts to nothing, which I guess is a good transition to the FOMC minutes that came out today, because one of the things that everybody is trying to figure out, and they're looking through the minutes, right, parsing through every word to try to figure out if the Fed is going to hike by 50 basis points in March or just 25. And I think now the odds are 60%. They're going to go 50, but neither 50 or 25 it's immaterial. It doesn't mean anything because even 50 basis point hike is not nearly enough to do the job. The Fed needs to hike rates much more than 50 basis points and they should do it right now. They shouldn't wait till March. The problem is they can't and that's why they won't. So again, they're pretending that this policy is actually going to fight inflation and they're hoping that it does, right? That they can fool the markets into thinking that inflation is going to come down and it will create some self fulfilling prophecy that the Fed could fight inflation by talking about tightening so they don't even actually have to tighten. But the problem is they're not even talking about tightening enough to really do anything about inflation. And the markets still don't even understand that, which is ridiculous because this is so obvious. This is not rocket science. It should be obvious that nobody can afford a rate high enough to actually fight inflation, especially the U.S. government, because the U.S. government is the biggest debtor of us all. And remember, Powell even admitted in one of these press conferences that the U.S. government's fiscal path is unsustainable, but that the only reason it's sustainable now is because interest rates are really low, but that if interest rates were not low, then it would be unsustainable. Well, since he knows that higher interest rates would be unsustainable for the federal government, he is not willing to deliver those higher rates. But the problem is, by keeping rates low, an unsustainable problem gets even worse. Now, maybe you can say, well, it's already so bad, so who cares if it gets worse? Which, in a way, there's some sympathy for that because it's already so big. But just because a problem is big doesn't mean you should make it bigger. You know, that is the mistake that they made with the real estate market. When they raised interest rates too slowly, when Greenspan went up from 1% to 6.5 in quarter point baby step increments because he didn't want to upset the markets, he enabled that bubble to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the Fed enticed homeowners 
into taking out big mortgages based on these cheeser rates, based on these adjustable rate mortgages. They didn't care what was going to happen when rates eventually went up. All they cared about was the fact that, hey, we can afford to buy the house right now because we can swing the payments. They did the same thing. It's the same moral hazard with the federal government. The government doesn't care about where interest rates are going to go. They just care where they are right now. Remember, for a long time, people on Capitol Hill were saying, money is so cheap, we should borrow it. And what I was saying back then was, hey, just because heroin is free doesn't mean you should use it. It's not like, oh my God, look, I can get all this free heroin. I don't want to waste it. Just because something is free doesn't mean you should take it. Just because the government could borrow a lot of money doesn't mean that it should, especially since it's borrowing with T-bills and it's got to roll these things over. And what happens when interest rates go up? Well, we know what happened in the housing market. Interest rates went up and the borrowers couldn't afford to pay. And we had the financial crisis. Well, when interest rates go up this time, the U.S. government won't be able to pay. And we'll have a much bigger financial crisis. Because when we had the 2008 financial crisis, the government was able to bail out all the lenders. But when this crisis is about the government and it's the government that's insolvent, there's no one that can bail out the government. The government bailed everybody out by printing money. They won't be able to bail anybody out by printing money next time because printing money is the problem. The dollar is crashing. They'll be printing money that nobody wants. They'll be printing money that won't buy anything. And so the government can't bail itself out, which is why investors have to recognize this and bail themselves out now in advance of the next crisis by putting in place the right investment portfolio and doing that as fast as you can. And I want to go over, though, some of the points from the minutes that were released here. Obviously, the Federal Open Market Committee members are more worried about inflation, right? They're acknowledging inflation. In fact, one of the points they made is they recognize that the inflation risks are tilted to the upside, tilted, as if it was kind of a close call. And yeah, it's just a little tilted to the upside rather than the downside. It's not tilted. Their target is 3%. We're at seven and a half, even if you believe their bogus numbers. So that's not a tilt. We have blown away their 2% inflation target. It's not that the outlook is tilted to the upside. We have a massive inflation problem right now. There is no tilt. And the Fed needs to do something about this inflation problem now. They just can't sit back and just see what happens and just acknowledge that the risk is slightly tilted to the upside, meaning that it still could surprise to the downside. So when you're talking about an inflation outlook that's tilted to the upside, that still means that you're not sure which side it's going. I mean, it may go to the downside. We just think it's a little bit more likely to go to the upside. There is no chance it's going to be the downside. The downside is below 2%. How are we possibly going to have inflation below 2%? It's not even within the realm of possibility. So this is not an outlook that is tilted. The outlook is massive inflation and it's getting worse, meaning inflation is going to get even higher if the Fed doesn't act decisively right now, which it's not doing. This is it. It's the putt to win the tournament. If you sink it, the championship is yours. But you're on the backswing and then your hat falls over your eyes. Is that how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated financial software? To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. I know from experience just how tough it is to manage a small business. You know, it seems like you're in a battle. You have all sorts of forces lining up against you. Rules, regulations, taxes that can bury you in paperwork. That's why NetSuite is so important because it provides you with a weapon to fight back. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system to power your growth with visibility and control over your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more. NetSuite is everything you need to grow all in one place. And with NetSuite, you can automate your processes and close your books in no time while staying well ahead of your competition. 93% of surveyed businesses increase their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. That's why over 28,000 businesses already use NetSuite. So for the new year, NetSuite is offering a new financing program for those who are ready to upgrade at netsuite.com slash gold. So head to netsuite.com slash gold right now for this free special one-of-a-kind financing offer on the number one financial system for growing your business. That's netsuite.com slash gold. 
The minutes also reveal the following. According to the FOMC members, if inflation doesn't move down, it would be appropriate to remove accommodation at a faster pace than anticipated. Now think about that. They're saying they're going to continue to be accommodative, even with the current inflation rate the way it is, which is way above 2%. But if inflation ends up moving up from here, I mean, getting even worse, that they may have to remove the accommodation faster, not get rid of the accommodation. They're going to pick up the pace at which they're becoming less accommodative. So they're not talking about, hey, if inflation ends up getting worse, we need to stop the accommodative policy and immediately adopt a restrictive policy. Nowhere in the minutes do they ever talk about a restrictive monetary policy, tight money. They just say we may have to reduce the pace at which we remove the accommodation. But the accommodation is going to still be there as they're removing it. So they're still going to be pouring gasoline on a fire that they are pretending they are trying to put out. Another funny part of this, I mean, it's only funny if you understand it, it's actually pretty sad, is that some of the FOMC members did want to start the quantitative tightening program, the shrinking of the balance sheet, a little sooner than other members, right? These are the hawks. The so-called hawks want to end QE sooner than the doves. I mean, again, there's no hawks. The hawks are extinct. They're like the dodo bird of the Fed. There's just doves and there's degrees of dovishness. So the FOMC members that are less dovish than the other members, see, they want to end QE sooner because they want to show, quote, that they're serious about fighting inflation. Serious about fighting inflation? If they were serious about fighting inflation, they would be for massive quantitative tightening right now. They would be jacking up interest rates right now. Nobody at the Fed is serious about fighting inflation, and that's the problem. But what the Fed is trying to do is pretend that they're serious about inflation because that's all they can do. Remember, it's like the opposite of the big stick policy of Teddy Roosevelt, right? Speak softly and carry a big stick. Well, when it comes to fighting inflation, the Fed has no stick at all. So it has to scream as loud as it can and hope that nobody notices that it doesn't have a stick. And also with respect to the balance sheet, the minutes reveal that FOMC members are conceding that this time the balance sheet runoff has to be faster than last time. And remember last time they said it would be like watching paint dry, right? Very boring, very slow. And they were able to knock about a trillion off the balance sheet, taking it from like four and a half trillion to three and a half trillion. Now it's nine trillion. And clearly they have a lot more work to do this time than last time. But even if they go double the pace of before, it's still not fast enough. And again, I don't even see how they are going to do it because if they are not doing QE, long-term interest rates are really going to rise. And that is going to be very problematic for many aspects of the economy. And in particular, as I already mentioned, the federal government itself. And there is going to be massive pressure on the Fed to monetize that debt, especially in an election year. Remember, I said that what we need to fight inflation is a contractionary fiscal policy. We need to have the government reduce the budget deficit so the Federal Reserve doesn't have to monetize all this debt. But what do you think is likely to be proposed coming into the midterm elections. More government spending, more programs, whatever part of the Build Back Better didn't get passed, they're going to offer that up again. And they're also going to talk about cutting taxes. I mean, even the Republicans aren't going to say we need to raise taxes. They're not going to be for that. They're still going to be for tax cuts. They're not going to care. I mean, these Republicans are talking about all this inflation as if it's got nothing to do with them. I mean, I am getting frustrated listening to guys like Larry Kudlow and Stephen Moore talking about all the inflation that Biden has created and talking about the Biden inflation tax as if Trump had no part of it, as if Kudlow and Moore, who were advising Trump, had no part of it. Because when Trump was president, we were running big deficits. Trump increased government spending and cut taxes. He created bigger debts for the Fed to monetize. And then he beat up the Fed and forced them and browbeated them into monetizing. The minute the Fed started to let interest rates go up, Trump was all over Powell, threatening to fire him. We want more cheap money, print more money, negative interest rates, more QE. And none of these guys were criticizing Trump. When Trump was demanding more inflation, you didn't hear a peep out of Cutlow or out of Moore. No, they were supporting Trump, which is why it's so hypocritical to say that all this started because of Biden's spending. Yes, the big increase in inflation began on Biden's watch, 
But we would have had it anyway. Had Trump been reelected to a second term, all of this would have been happening on his watch. Now, of course, I'm glad that it's getting associated with Biden rather than Trump, which is one of the reasons that I've said that it was a good thing, maybe that Trump didn't get reelected. So the blame would fall on Biden. But the problem is the people who are criticizing Biden are not being honest about the Republicans' role in the process, as if all we have to do is go back to the Trump policies and the problem's gonna get solved. No, because the Trump policies would continue to make the problem worse because Trump didn't care about the deficits. He didn't care about sound money. He may have campaigned on those themes, but he didn't govern on those themes. And if he got a second term, there's no reason to believe he would govern any differently in the second. The only thing would be he would inherit an inflation problem instead of before when he just inherited a stock market bubble. But if you remember, as a candidate, he was very critical of the bubble until he owned the bubble and then he wanted to make it bigger. So I don't really know what Trump would do if he inherited the inflation problem because Trump had an opportunity to do something about these problems when he was president last time, and instead he took the politically expedient way out. And so he may make the same mistake again, because as I said, there is no easy fix to this. What we are experiencing is the consequence of a generation of can kicking. It's every time the Federal Reserve tried to artificially stimulate the economy by creating inflation. Well, now those inflation chickens have come home to roost and there's no quick fix to turn this around. People think that this is just a new problem, something that started with the pandemic. It goes long before the pandemic. It just took the pandemic for the problems to really emerge in a way that was so big that nobody could avoid it. But again, it's the same type of mistake they made with subprime. When a lot of people saw the subprime problem initially in 07, and the reason that so many people thought the problem was contained was because they didn't understand it. They didn't realize how deep this iceberg went, how much was really beneath the surface. All they can see was that little bit that was peeking out that was subprime. So now they're seeing this inflation and they have no idea how deep this rabbit hole goes. There is so much inflation lying beneath the surface. They're looking at the tip of this iceberg again and they don't understand it. They don't know that this is the consequence of years and years of bad monetary policy. And a lot of people still expect us to return to the low inflation of the past because they think that that's some new normal, that now, you know, we have permanently low interest rates because we have permanently low inflation. That was an aberration. Where we are now is back to reality. This is the normal. It's high inflation. When you print all this money and have all these big deficits, you have high inflation. This period of low inflation is over and it's not coming back. And it's because we had that for so long. We were lulled into this false sense of complacency. The Fed was able to create so much inflation because as it printed more and more money and it didn't immediately see the consequences, it kept printing more. Well, now the consequences are here and there's a lot more to it than what we've already experienced. And in the meantime, we continue to make a problem we don't understand worse. And as a result, nothing that the Fed is doing, nothing that the government is doing is going to reduce inflation inflation. Everything they're doing is going to make it worse. And so the investors who somehow celebrate these high inflation numbers because they think, aha, this is finally going to cause the Fed to do something about it and bring inflation down. I mean, if you look at what's happening with the yield curve, 10-year treasuries, 30-year treasuries are not rising nearly as fast as the one year. And if you listen to the way the conventional media is covering this flattening of the yield curve, it's because they're saying investors are pricing in a policy mistake that the Fed is going to get too aggressive. They're going to raise rates too much in the short run, and that's going to cause a recession. And so then they're going to have to cut rates. And so that's why the longer end is not moving up as much because it's factoring in the rate cuts that are going to follow the rate hikes. The policy mistake is not going to be that the Fed raises rates too much. The policy mistake is that it won't raise them enough. And the reason it can't raise them enough is because it lowered them too much and left them too low in the first place. That was the actual mistake. It's not raising them now. It was cutting them in the past. And once they made that mistake, they pretty much condemned us. There's nothing they could do now that would produce the so-called soft landing. It's a crash no matter what they do. But the markets are wrong to think that the next recession is going to bring about a reduction in long-term interest rates. 
It's not because the inflation genie is out of the bottle and by then everybody is going to know it. When the Fed has to pivot because the economy does go into recession, but inflation is still a problem, inflation is going to become an even bigger problem and long-term interest rates are going to go up. Because what the bond market is factoring in is a slowdown in the economy, but what they're missing is a pickup in inflation as the economy slows. And those inflation premiums need to be built into this yield curve. And so that's what the markets don't get. Long-term interest rates are not going to respond to the next downturn the way they've responded to the last several, because in the past, we didn't have an inflation problem. This time we do, and those interest rates are going to go up, not down. And that's going to exacerbate the severity of this recession. And so the Fed is going to have to do even more QE than it did before, because if it wants to keep interest rates from going way up, it's going to have to print even more money to buy bonds that everybody else is dumping. And that's going to really fuel the inflation problem, which may turn it into a hyperinflation problem. That is the risk. That is what nobody is talking about. Nobody has recognized this yet. But slowly, more and more people are going to figure it out. And at some point, that is going to be reflected in a much bigger way in the markets. And then the markets are going to snowball as we get to a critical mass of people who understand it. We don't have to have everybody understanding it. We don't even have to have a majority. We just need a critical mass of people around the world figuring this out. And then it's game over. (laughs) 